So welcome to the workshop, everyone. Um, I'm going to give a bit of an overview of how this will be working. As mentioned in the welcome to the conference, we will be respecting the friendly space policy. Um, we have uh, folks you can talk to about that, such as Stuart Pryor, if there are any issues. This workshop is being recorded. Um, it's being recorded on Zoom and will be uploaded to YouTube afterwards and hopefully Wikipedia Commons. So if you do not wish to appear in a video, please do keep your video or camera off. Um, we do have active and uh, passive participants. The idea with being an active participant is that you can come on camera and uh, interact with the panelists. Uh, I'd ask you to keep your camera muted when you're not speaking. Um, and everyone is able to take part in the chat and leave comments or questions there. Um, when you're doing that, just check that when using the chat, it's set to everyone. So if you've got that set up, um, there's a drop down menu near the bottom of the chat section, which says, gives you a few options, including hosts and panelists and everyone you want to message everyone so that we can all see your comments. Okay. And of course, do please join the Celtic Knots Telegram groups if you have Telegram and would like to take part in the conversations around the conference. So here's the agenda for what we'll be doing today. Um, we're going to have a brief warm up session uh, just to get us in the mood for interacting on Zoom. Uh, and then we're going to be having uh, some interaction with our main speakers. So there'll be a few different phases of uh, some conversations and question and answer. Uh, and then we'll be going into the wrap up session at the end. Just to recap the key points from this workshop. So I think it's time for that warm up activity. Um, I would like to hear from people in the chat. Uh, what kind of communities and projects are you involved in? Uh, what would you like to learn about or get help with about growth in your community? Uh, and please do feel free to write those in your chat. Uh, for those active participants who are here, uh, you're welcome to unmute your microphone and say your answer on camera. So let me have a look at the chat. Excellent. And I'm glad you're here as well, Alu, and everyone else too. It's good to see you turned out for this workshop. So what communities and projects are you involved in? So do feel free to use the chat. Thank you, Sham. Um, apologies if I have mispronounced your name. Um, and do feel free to correct me at any point during the workshop if I do that. Um, so we have someone from New Zealand uh, helping communities uh, running activities at the Wellington Meetup. Uh, yes, very busy there indeed. And looking for tips, any tips to grow communities. I think one of the things with this is that, yeah, there will be some tips with this. And often it's a case of looking for ideas and seeing what that sparks. Thank you, Bunty and Abdul. So, uh, Bunty, who is working with Wikimedia Australia, working with uh, Bhutanese and uh, Zonka languages. Um, I think it's worth saying as well that Bunty has an update in the video pool about 
the work that uh, those communities have been doing. So well worth listening to as well, especially with how they've been dealing with the challenges of being able to travel uh, around COVID-19. And an update from the, sorry, uh, a representative from the Moore community as well. Uh, thank you, Ramati. So looking to create awareness amongst librarians in Nigeria uh, on the importance of Wikimedia. This is all good stuff. Um, I am reading out the comments for the benefit of the recording as well. Oh, and someone from Estonian Wikimedia. Uh, so there's the Estonian language and the Voro language, uh, which they a dialect of Estonian. And it sounds like you're very interested in helping that community grow. So, excellent. I think that helps gives us uh, a bit of an idea about the, the different kind of groups involved here and what we can get out of this. Uh, Al Hassan Alaitu from the Mora community as well, welcome. Uh, and representatives from Dagbani Wikipedia and the Twi community as well, both of which are in Ghana and looking to help their communities grow. So, I think we are now ready to get rolling. Uh, and James from Sustainable Development Goal in Nigeria. Now, we're going to move on to the uh, discussions with our main speakers, uh, Tochi and Isaac. So what I'll be doing is I'll be asking them a couple of questions. They'll be uh, answering from their particular viewpoints. And then you as the audience get to ask them questions. Uh, you get to look for their insight. So let's start with our first question. What activities have you run to involve editors. So I think the first question will be going to Tochi. So Tochi, what kind of activities have you run to involve editors? All right, um, thank you. Hi everyone, good morning. And I'm actually very glad to meet all of you. And thank you for the opportunity. Um, Wikimedia UK. So for me, uh, I'm from the Igbo Wikimedia and Suza group. And I remember um, while we were starting out the Igbo Wikimedia and Suza group, the, it, it might vary for everyone. But for us, the, the steps we took were, first of all, we identified what we were starting the community. Um, these were the activities. We identified while we were starting the community. We wanted to promote the Igbo language, wanted to digitize the Igbo language, also wanted to um, kind of preserve the Igbo language. So we found a purpose, which is one thing you should be able to find, identify why you're starting the community. Then the next thing we did was, who are we starting this community for? Who were the targets? These were the activities, who were the targets? We identified that we wanted to target everyone who was literate in Igbo language, even if you're not from um, the Eastern part of Nigeria, but as long as you can speak Igbo, you were, um, you're one of our targets. Then another thing was our value proposition. What are we offering these people? We came from the angle of, we want to preserve our language, we want to um, promote the language, because um, according to UNESCO, Igbo language was um, mentioned, or should I say, um, noted as one of the um, endangered languages which might phase off um, in the year 2050. I don't know if we're going to be here till then, but then that was um, what UNESCO mentioned. And for us, it was kind of an activism kind of thing. And we put it to the community as a value for them. This is also what we're offering them. We're offering you the opportunity to 
preserve this language. We're offering you the opportunity to promote this language. So they saw something to fight for and they saw something to work for. So that was the value for them. Then another thing we, um, another step or another activity was how will we reach out to them? What were the channels? You need to figure out the channels that you'll be able to use to reach out to the people that you're targeting. It's one thing to know them, it's one thing to have a purpose, it's one thing to offer them something. But then if you don't know where to find them, you're not going anywhere. So this was one other thing. We found the channels we had, um, most of them were on um, social media. Some of them we had to do outreaches. Some of them we had to go to um, ministries of public enlightenment and um, visit um, key people and key stakeholders. So these were part of our activities. Another thing was what activities were we going to um, be conducting if we bring all of these people together? We found that some people were interested in writing about the Igbo culture. Some were interested in writing about other things, but in Igbo language. Some were interested in contributing to data in Igbo language. Some were interested in images and a whole lot of things. So we kind of put all these together to develop our program plan of activities that they were going to be involved in so that if they come, they have something to do. Then another thing we, um, another activity was now the management. How are we going to be managing these people that we're bringing together? So these were the things we had to put in place. And then sustainability. We are into this. We want to do all of this, but we do not want it to phase out in the next three months. How are we going to be able to sustain this? So we started having um, like leaders training people and their skills and building their skills. There were more people who were kind of more enthusiastic who we saw could carry the mantra to. So we decided to also build the skills of these people. So tomorrow, if you look for Tochi and you don't find Tochi, you might see someone else who is able to do exactly what Tochi um, was doing. So this was um, the things we put together and the activities we put up together to be able to um, start up our community. I don't know. <laughs> thank you. So thank you very much. So Isaac. Um, what kind of activities uh, did you run to involve editors in? Thank you very much, uh, Richard, and for the privilege for bringing me here to talk about growing communities, especially small languages communities. Um, you know, languages defines uh, values. You know, it tells people who you are and uh, what kind of culture and environment you come from. And it's, uh, to me, I said a lot about starting a community. Uh, but it's one thing to start a community, it's one thing to continue to engage them. And that's uh, primarily most of the work that we do after we start these communities. And um, when you start a community, you need to clearly define the strategy of engagement. How do you want to keep the community running? What activities do they need to be involved in? You know, practicable activities that can keep them around. What are the most things that interest volunteers? How do you retain volunteers? How do you recruit volunteers? Because we understand that these are integral part of the Wikimedia movement and the new projects that has been started. Um, part of the thing we do, first of all, is to recruit volunteers. Uh, we develop different strategies to recruit volunteers from one-on-one -on -one campaign to social media awareness campaigns. And sometimes we, we design series of videos, you know, that will attract people, you know, showing what the, the, the languages and the values in those languages. So that way, we get people among other strategies to recruit them. So when you recruit these people, what next? What do you need to do? What do they need to know? How are they going to do what? Who is responsible for this? So we organize a series of trainings to engage them. First of all, to introduce them to the new project. Uh, for example, you're about Wikipedia, tell them what it is, the values, the mission and the visions, and what we intend to achieve at the end of the day. Then after the introduction, we begin to look at the technical aspect of it. How do they want to contribute? First of all, we try to understand how people want to contribute. What do they find interesting you know, in contributing? Some people just want to add photos to articles. Some people want to correct spellings. They are good at you know, uh, doing copy editing. Some find it interesting writing new articles from scratch. So we try to identify the strength of these people. 
and you know shining our resources towards you know making it much more uh, interesting for them. So we've got a nice series of trainings, uh, you know, involving different technical uh, aspects of the project. You know, ranging from how to create an article to how to edit articles, including how the Wikimedia projects that involves uh, uh, you know uploading of images uh, like the Wikimedia Commons. Then we have the new project. The Wikidata as well. So we allow people to decide what they find very much interesting. But overall, we understand that the small language Wikipedia needs attention, and we try to let them see reasons why they should participate in that. So after the trainings, we don't just um, train them and allow them to go. We continue to mentor them. You know, we continue to review their works, provide feedbacks, show them how to fix problems, how to you know correct small errors. And we sometimes help them to do it if they find it you know, interesting. Because we understand that when new editors come on board, they encounter a lot of challenges, possibly because they forget some of the things that they've been taught, or they don't know how to find their ways around because they, it looks like more of a techy thing to them. So we are always on ground. We have experienced people who you know, monitor them. And what we just do basically is to group them. So we have adopted uh, WhatsApp uh, you know, as a major platform for this mentorship program. So we assign at least two experienced editors in those groups that monitor their works and promptly respond to queries and questions and concerns about their works. So after they've gained significant experience, uh, we involve them in editor tones, which means we, we bring them together to you know, focus on a particular subject area. For example, we can say, we want to write about Yoruba women today and let's come together so we show them. So that's, you know, help them to build confidence. You know, uh, they learn to write new articles, they learn to add photos, they learn to upload photos. So they have physical contact with you, they ask questions, you help them fix problems. Next time they want to try it on their own. So then after that, we also look at other aspects of uh, engagement, uh, such as campaign and context, because we realize that campaigns appear to be one of the, one of the most you know, effective way of engaging the editors. They want to be on the top. They want to show the world that they can actually, you know, do what you are doing and all of that. And especially when there are rewards, they want to win the prizes, no matter how small. If it's um, um, a, a, a voucher, for example, so they compete for that. So in the process, they get added to the projects they want to do more. Uh, and sometimes we also do what we call quiz. So we can say, okay, let's come together. We, we do that to text their level of understanding of basic policies. For example, we can say, hey, uh, who can tell us, uh, or give examples of reliable sources? So we listen to them. Uh, then when they get it wrong, we tell them why that uh, source might not be reliable, for example. Then we'll sometimes say, okay, uh, which uh, policy saves dates? For example, which policy says you should not create multiple accounts? Uh, undisclosed multiple accounts. You somebody jumping up and say, hey, it's soft puberty. Somebody say, so we, we use that to gauge their you know, experience and familiarity with the project. Then one other thing we do is that we, had, we assign roles to them. You know, people want to be given responsibilities. We want them to you know, feel as part of the communities. We give them uh, different roles. We can say, oh, we're having events today, just like what we did yesterday. We say, hey, you are in charge of providing the banner. These are the resources you need to do that. You discover that many of these people have potentials. They can do all kinds of things, and they feel, you know, welcome, and they feel uh, it gives them a sense of belonging as part of the, you know, community. Then again, one of the ways we stick them around is to uh, assign them a leadership roles. You know, we, you know, we also let them take what leadership is. You know, for example, we can say, okay, you are the secretary, or you are the logistics manager. You are in charge of. You know, managing all events, you know, stuff like that, give them a sense of responsibility. And all of these act activities and classes actually, uh, you know, make them stick around. Absolutely. Um, I think that's some really interesting points about giving people responsibility as well, as well as providing them support and giving them feedback on what is they're doing. So, Let's see. So uh, we'll head on to the next question uh, and then we'll address this and move on to a brief Q&A from the audience. So do you use other tools aside from the Wikimedia websites to grow your community? Uh, I believe it's, is it Tochi who's ask, answering that question? Oh no, you're both answering this one. Yeah. 
All right. So um, for us, um, there are other ways we've used to grow the Igbo community. One of them is of wiki events participation. Um, we've um, attended events as speakers, um, events hosted by Google volunteers, um, 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 startups, entrepreneurs, and the rest of them. Events also organized by librarians and maybe some other government um, organizations and also NGOs. So these are good ways or good avenues to spread the news about your community, to share what your community is involved in, and also to invite people to join your community. Another thing we do is um, for us to be able to get, um, grow the community is we try to identify like should I say key people or key leaders in various areas and various skills. Let's say, for example, in the Igbo community, we have what we call hubs. And these hubs are, um, they are shared according to projects. And there are people who are more savvy than the other and they head these communities. We have um, the data hub, we have the commons um, hub, we have um, campus clubs, and we also have, um, the librarians' hubs. We have um, a particular librarian who has a community of over 100 librarians. So for that, we had um, a hub which she heads because she's also very savvy in um, things related to the wiki community and the wiki movement. So this hub she heads caters to librarians and all they do or most of the things they do is correcting citations, references, and anything to make our articles have more quality. Then we have the data hub. This data hub, what they, what, um, they do, the way they recruit is going to universities. They have connections in various universities across the North, um, the North Central, the Northeast, and also the Southern part of Nigeria. So this involving people, has also helped to grow our community. Another thing is our social media channels. We have Twitter, we have um, we have Twitter, we have Instagram, we have Facebook and LinkedIn. It has also helped to um, at least create awareness of our communities. Another good thing we do is, if you're part of our community and we have an event, we always tell our community members, next time you're coming, come with one more person. So it makes it in, in, in some ways or in some families, maybe it's a family of five or a family of three, you see that they are all wiki editors. And this is because we're more like, bring um, the next time you're coming, bring another person to the community. And you see someone coming the next time with her son or her daughter or his, um, his friend or maybe his wife. So it has also helped us to grow and bring more enthusiastic people into the community. So these are various ways that we've been able to grow our community and also um, mentoring the people and teaching the people who have been brought in. We have key people who are more enthusiastic about teaching others. So when we have the new people coming in, we get to pair them. We have um, like, should I call it unofficial or informal mentorship um, programs that we assign these people to do. They train, if it's Wikidata that you care so much about, we send it to someone who is serving Wikidata. If it's commons, then there's someone for it. If it is Wikipedia, we have people. If it's Wikiquote, we have people. So you don't get to um, maybe fall behind or slack, even when we've tried so much to bring you into the community. So these are ways we've tried to grow our community. Excellent. So Isaac. Thank you very much, uh, Toshi. <laughs> she has covered so much on uh, other ways we can grow uh, communities, but um, technically, we also, as much as possible, you know, do series of offline activities to engage these people, uh, most of which uh, Toshi has uh, described. But uh, we also use some, you know, packages like the Google packages, uh, the Gmail, for example, where we have a single thread to, you know, take care of um, discussions around certain projects or activities. Uh, that was what we used in our earliest days before we discovered that we can also have mailing lists. So when we discovered that we can have mailing lists was when we created mailing lists. So mailing lists was uh, one of the most effective ways uh, we uh, you know, engaged our communities in the past, uh, aside from the on-wiki uh, uh, 
uh, space. Then um, we also use um, social media because um, it's been established that social media has uh, you know, the ability to actually influence you because most people who edit Wikipedia, according to the research that was conducted in Nigeria about three, four years ago, uh, most of the users of Wikipedia are mostly youth and they are found on the social media space. So we explore the social media space as a very huge platform. We take advantage of you know, that platform to recruit people. And some one of the ways we have done, I mean, we have uh, grown our community through that is that we try to create very attractive you know, uh, posts and sometimes videos. And we've had people you know, sending us private email to say, I want to learn more about Yoruba Wikipedia. How can I join Yoruba Wikipedia? So that way we just uh, say, okay, read more about what we do. We share our meta page with them and ask them to, you know, attend one of our events. So, and with that experience, they want to stick around. So that has been very, very effective in engaging the volunteers, Facebook uh, especially. Then later on, uh, Twitter uh, happens to be another powerful tool that has really helped also grow our communities. You know, for example, Yoruba content are not really much on the internet space. You know, so when you write in Yoruba language and you just tweet it, you just see people coming around to retreat that thing. So it shows that they see value in that language. When you write in English, they, they really you know, engage that post. But when you write in that indigenous language, they want to retreat it. And many of them has actually reached out to us to say, hey, what do you guys do? We have also used that platform as well. Then the WhatsApp uh, has really been extremely useful for us. You know, I talked about mentorship earlier. And, um, and one of the challenges we had earlier with mentorship is, what platform do we need to use that, that is very popular, you know, that people will find very interesting that we consume less internet data? Because that's one of the challenges we're facing in Nigeria, for example. So we identify WhatsApp as um, a very uh, simple tool to use that is popular among the people that they can easily relate with. So we adopted WhatsApp as a major platform to, you know, engage these people. And that has actually worked, uh, you know, effectively for us. Uh, Instagram, well, uh, to use Instagram, you probably need somebody who understand how to, uh, you know, manage social media and because uh, it's much more technical for most people. So somehow we operate legs on Instagram, even though we find that useful uh, as well. So uh, Zoom is the emergence of Zoom also makes things extremely, you know, easy for us because it was it was not really very popular until the COVID uh, uh, nineteen pandemic uh, outbreak then. So things uh, we learned about Zoom, it has also been a way to engage people and also grow the communities because people sometimes might be too busy to come on site. They say, oh, how can we join? And we want them to be part of the program. We want them to stick around. So we have no choice. Say, okay, you can join online. Uh, here's a link for you to join. So that has also helped us because a lot of people have actually learned through that. One thing we also did, uh, it was a new experiment that we did last year to also grow our community, was the central notice banner. We use the central notice banner because we understand that a lot of people from Nigeria, for example, more than 98% visit the English Wikipedia. So, and many of them can actually contribute to the small language Wikipedia. So what we did basically was to display a central notice banner on the English Wikipedia to log out users saying, hey, the Yoruba Wikipedia also exists. If you want to contribute to it, you can join. In less than 24 hours, we have more than 1,000 people registered to say they want to be trained on how to contribute. Yeah, it was a very huge success, and we started engaging them. And we've had more than 100 of these people sticking around and stay part of our community. So that was a, a, a very strategic way to grow our community. And uh, I would strongly recommend that if anybody is interested you know, in learning more about that, uh, I'll be happy to support and uh, I can bet it's an effective way to recruit volunteers for small languages. Thank you. Excellent. Very interesting indeed. So it's now up to our audience. Um, having heard from uh, Tochi and Isaac, um, you are now able to ask some questions. Um, it can be about uh, what they've said specifically or you're welcome to ask questions around other kinds of activities um, which can involve editors. Uh, we'll have two more sections after this, talking about engaging people and helping communities grow. So I ask you to keep your questions to 
activities you can do to engage new editors um, and how to actually set that kind of thing up. So please use the chat if you are one of the viewers or if you're one of the active participants, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your questions directly to our speakers. And just a quick note, um, I will say that you don't need to do anything like raise your hand, you can just unmute yourself straight away. You're more than welcome to do that. So what I will do, um, as I'm currently unmuted, and to give folks a moment or two to think about any questions, um, is ask, um, have you used the outreach dashboard for any of your activities? And what was that like? Um, are there any kind of things which it doesn't do, which you'd really wish it did? And this okay. is, sorry, carry on. Okay, thank you, Richard. Yes, outreach dashboard appears to one of the most useful tools to community managers in the recent time. And it has been one of the tools that we use majorly to track, you know, contributions uh, uh, for participants. But largely it also comes with its own problems. Um, one of the problems it comes with is that once you had anybody there, whether they contribute to your project or not, it still keep counting as part of the contributions to your project. And that makes result inaccurate. And I'm looking forward to a way we can actually improve that tool and you know, make it uh, much more uh, uh, accurate in terms of you know, evaluating and you know, uh, um, managing the report or result of those campaigns. But by and large, it's, it's a very useful tool that we do adopt from time to time. And up to now, uh, there's no alternative yet. So we're still using it and finding a way to filter our results uh, and you know, refine it to be much more accurate than we okay. wanted to. I think you just almost covered it all. The dashboard has really been helpful. And just like Isaac said, it has its own challenges. Sometimes it tracks some edits. Sometimes it doesn't even track edits. Sometimes it feels like it comes to a halt. And no matter how much you try, it doesn't keep um, improve. It doesn't keep improving. Sometimes you have people adding up to 100 um, inputs and then the dashboard just stops at 80. So that is one of the challenges we've encountered. So sometimes when we have like contest or we have um, these edits, we try to merge it with the X2. We use the X2 to track um, some of the things that have been imputed. Okie dokie. So thank you for that answer. Um, yeah, a really good point about how it just kind of picks up everything. So we've got a few questions in the chat. Uh, we have, oh, someone has a hand up. Uh, so I will invite you to unmute. We're going to see how that works. Um, if it doesn't work, you will need to put your question in chat. Okie dokie, we may come back to that one. So let's see, the next question we had, uh, from Sean was uh, when you hold in-person events, how do you publicize them successfully? Um, and then she says, we've had new editors turn up for particular events, but um, many don't engage with the community after that particular event. So it's two questions there really about how do you publicize them um, and how do you keep them interested 
after that first event. Uh, so I think that can be answered by either Isaac or Tochi. All right, um, thank you. So for us, um, when we have, okay, first of all, starting from the root, Isaac mentioned WhatsApp group. It is very, very essential to have like a community group. You might decide WhatsApp, you might decide Telegram, but WhatsApp has been more effective. You might want to try Telegram because it carries more people. Now, each time we have an in-person event, we first of all design um, flyers for social media. Um, we first post it in the WhatsApp group to inform our already existing members that we have so so and so events on so so and so day. So you try to make this as early as possible so that they can add it to their calendar of events and make out time for whatever um, um, activity you have. Now, the next thing we do is to publicize it on our social media channels. We have Instagram, we have LinkedIn, we have Twitter and we have Facebook. Now, um, we've had situations where people from the UK, the US sent people who are in Nigeria to attend our event. Now, this helps to um, create awareness of whatever um, events you want to carry out. Now, after the event has taken place, you're going to have new editors. These new editors, some of them might not, it might be an editor ton for Wikipedia, and a lot of them will not like to write the long articles. They might not like the experience of writing the long articles, so they don't come back. What we do is that on every event, we try as much as possible to mention and teach every, like give an overview of all other existing wiki projects. Now we let them know that today we're going to be focusing on this, but you might want to, um, focus on this or you might want to work on this because this is your preferred way of working or because this is what resonates more with you try to give them choices and try to give them a choice try to give them other things that they can contribute to we've had people who don't speak Igbo come to the Igbo community and attend Igbo events we didn't let the challenge of the language be a problem we we directed them to other projects they can contribute to while also being members of the community. We've had Wikidata, we have Wikicommons, we have Wikibooks that they can contribute to. So try to give them a choice so that they find something that will interest them to keep coming back and to also share the knowledge that they have. Don't just limit them to one, um, maybe one project and they think that's all. It's my suggestion. It's a really nice suggestion, especially around people who don't speak that particular language and how they can still help. Um, Isaac, do you have any brief thoughts on that? And I'll head on to the next question. Thank you very much, Richard. And um, Toshi for that elaborate uh, uh, explanation. Um, for us, we have um, a standard uh, operating procedure for events, so which are documented procedures on how events should be conducted. Uh, and that also includes uh, procedures and how on how it should be publicized. Uh, you know, some events just target new editors, some just target um, uh, Wikipedians, some are for outsiders. So we try to identify who this particular uh, event is for. For example, if we are doing something like um, a written editor tone, for example. So uh, we're primarily looking at people who can write articles. You know, uh, but if we're looking at training people, we're looking at new people from different part of the sphere of um, career to say, okay, come around, let's see what interests you and all of that. So um, publicizing it um, has never been a challenge per se because uh, we adopt the various platforms to promote those uh, events. For example, if we are targeting experienced volunteers, maybe we're interested in writing article or bridging a content gap in a particular area, for example, we want to write about women. So we know we need experienced editors to do that. So we just share the, you know, uh, uh, we publicize this on our WhatsApp group where we have every members of our communities. Then we also share on a major mailing links where you have experienced editors. So that way we, we recruit the right people for the right event. So if we're looking at training new volunteers, we know we have to go to social media 
to you know invite people or adopt a different strategy. So what I'm saying next is that the type of event we want to host depends on our target audience, and we follow our you know our documented procedures in doing that, and that also includes how we you know successfully uh, publicize these events. So, uh, like I said earlier uh, in my earliest uh, comments, when you recruit them, for example, if it's an event that involves new people, uh, you know, after they come on board, you start with the mentorship programs, you know, you mentor them, review their works, provide suggestions, feedbacks, help them to fix problems, you know, and later on, you assign responsibilities to them. You can say, okay, you are looking at creating five articles. You are looking for the first people to create these articles. It's just punch it to them. You realize that many of them want to compete, you know, in a way. So you see them, you know, trying to write that same articles. And that way you engage them and they want to do more. I mean, they find it interesting when the article is live and, you know, people are reading about it. So uh, that way they stick around. Excellent. So, uh... Before we move on, I think we've got time for one more question in this section from James. James, I'm going to ask you to unmute if you're able to, um, or if you don't want to, that's absolutely fine. Um, and I will ask a question on your behalf. So I'll give you a moment because there should be a pop up appearing for you. Okie dokie then. So James asks, what are the challenges you faced while starting out uh, and how have the challenges helped your community growth? And this is for both Isaac and uh, Tochi um, and that's very helpful to indicate as well. So thank you, James. Thank you um, for the question, James. Thank you. So um, everything has its own challenges. First of all, the, the challenge we experienced at the onset was um, editor retention. And um, another challenge we experienced was, um, should I say lack of awareness, but then we had to sit back, um, go back to the drawing board to see how we could overcome these challenges. One of the things we um, did to overcome the challenge was, number one, getting other people involved who were doing it, we, we, us, us, and it was kind of tiring. We sat back to realize that there were other people who were interested to help. There were other people who could even do better. Now we gave these people the opportunity and they help in outreaches, they helped in creating the hubs that we're talking about. They helped in these hubs. They are more like catchment areas, not, um, not the normal Wikimedia hub that we're um, having discussions on. They are more like bringing it closer to the communities, to the people where they are. So this helped us to overcome that challenge of um, awareness because now we have more people spreading the gospel. Another thing was um, in terms of editor retention, we now decided to still go back and bring out more um, projects that people would be interested in, um, bring out more programs. And we're also still trying to add more projects. It was just last year that we started the wiki put because for my community, we've never heard or we've never started anything that had to do with wiki put. It was um, September, October last year. That was when we got involved in Wikiquotes. And there are more people who even prefer Wikiquotes to writing Wikipedia articles. Now our Wikiquotes has been um, approved to come out of the incubator. So these kind of things were the things we decided to do. You just need to go back and rethink and put yourself in the shoes of the people that you might want to be reaching out to and find out what would be better for them. You can even ask questions ask the already existing people and they will tell you. So these, these were the challenges we faced for us as a community. Okie dokie. Uh, thank you again for that answer. Um, so wrapping up this section, uh, let's think about the key points from it. 
Um, so do feel free to put in um, a short message in chat. It can be just a word about uh, something you've taken away from this. If you feel like writing something a bit longer, you're welcome to as well. And for our active participants, you're also welcome to unmute. So I'm looking for uh, what are the key points we can take away from this particular part of the discussion. Uh, for me, I think one of the most important things is to find a tool where you can communicate with people, um, a tool which works for your um, works for your community and for your purposes. So the stuff about WhatsApp being very useful, um, I think, is really useful to come in up to keep in mind. Okie dokie then. So I'll give you a few more moments just to see if there's any other key points to put in the chat. Right. Oh, and uh, a comment from Sean saying the points about how to publicize events and then follow up with support for contributors is really important. Um, giving them options about how they can contribute as well, um, and Isaac's thoughts on the audience. Uh, and a, a comment from Ali that, that was a really nice presentation from both of you there. Um, one other thing that really stuck with me is the use of the banner on the English Wikipedia to let people know that um, these other wikis exist. So moving on to the next section, uh, what we have here is how to retain and engage editors. So hopefully this will address some of the questions uh, which I think people were edging towards, uh, especially uh, Alu's, I think I remember correctly. So we'll have a, a similar format where we'll have a couple of questions at the start of this section and then a Q&A again. So keep in mind what you'd like to ask and I may revisit one of the early questions. So uh, once people have started editing, what support do they get from the community? And we'll start with Tochi. Um, thank you. So from my community, you gain mentorship. Um, we have different projects, like I said, and we get to introduce you into the various projects and you decide which you want to go for. And we have cool people who are willing to um, help others grow in these mentorships. Apart from the projects themselves, there are also people who are more, um, who want to be more into the community coordination part of it. And we have mentorship on this. There are people who also want to um, run their own individual projects. So we have mentorship for this. If you would like to maybe tomorrow apply for a rapid grant to run your own project, we totally support you. And we totally put you through on how to organize um, wiki events and so that you can be very well grounded in the community. Another thing is capacity building across projects. We have monthly webinars. Um, sometimes I'm not going to say we're perfect. Sometimes we miss out on um, some months, but we try as much as possible to build the capacity of our members through monthly webinars, apart from the edited tones. We invite um, community members and also non-community members who are um, serving in one, two, or one part of the um, wiki stuff or the other. Um, we, we did, we've done um, capacity building on using the ESA tool. We've done um, capacity building on um, fixing um, reference errors. We are trying to um, get people on board to do UCOC and the movement strategy. So building capacity of people up, across um, projects and across things so that they can find something to do. We've also started a Wikimental Africa program and the Wikimental Africa program is um, to help to develop the um, capacity of African developers across um, various African countries. So for this, we have mentors. We've had people like Lucas from um, Belgium or Deutschland. I, 
uh, I'm just trying to remember. Um, we've had people like Eugene from Cameroon trying to teach people on various things. Um, we've, we've done the eye naturalist. Um, we've done um, the SPACUL. So these are various capacity building projects that we've identified to build the capacity of our um, um, community members. And not just every time you want to edit Wikipedia. Another thing is like I keep mentioning choice of project um, preference, give them choice so that they have things, they can try out their, um, their hands on various stuff and know what they are more interested in. Some people are not, they don't like um, being stuck with one thing and they can easily get bored. So you just, if, you, if today you feel like I don't want Wikipedia anymore, there's quote, quote is very short, that's so cool. If, if you don't want quote, there is data and you think that doesn't work for you, carry your phone or carry your camera, keep taking pictures and come and upload to comments for us. So these are choices. Then we also give them leadership opportunities. Um, we have people heading the hubs, like I said, we have people we call up, um, to come and teach others what they know. And this has helped to keep them engaged and to retain them. We also have people that want to run their own projects. And when we're applying for our intern for our annual grants, we factor that in that there are community members who might want to um, have, run their own personal projects that they feel resonate more with the community goals. And we have they have opportunities to apply for the internal grants and run their own programs. And they can also test out these skills before they go ahead to apply for more formal rapid grants. And the skills development, like I said, it is very, very important to keep building their skills so they can get to um, compete in the global Wikiverse and not just um, maybe the Igbo community, Igbo community team. We're trying to build members who can also compete in the outside world, in the Wikiverse. We have a lot of our members who are working as Wikimedians in residence um, for various firms, NGOs, and a lot of them. And what we do is that me personally, I'm a Wikipedian in residence. I try to also mentor these people. I share opportunities with um, our community members so that they can build their skills to take up these opportunities and also spread the gospel um, across the world and not just um, maybe the Nigerian community or maybe just the African community. So these are the various ways we've been trying to retain um, our community members. And these are the things they get from being part of the community. And you can also sell this out to other people that you might want to um, talk to or you might want to win over to be part of your community. So this, you can put these as also part of your value propositions to them. Thank you. Excellent. And Isaac, your thoughts on the matter of once people have started editing, what support do they get from the community? Okay. Uh, by and large, when people uh, come around to contribute, so we try as much as possible to help them build capacity. Uh, and building this capacity, we do that based on their needs. Some people don't really need to start from scratch. You know, when they come newly, you group them into a group. Then you begin to mentor them. After some time, you begin to understand what do they need to improve on. Some people basically just need to learn how to cite references. Some people just need to know how to you know, uh, add categories. So we group them based on their levels of experience and we, you know, uh, retrain them on that. Then one thing we also do, uh, we understand that being part of the community comes with a lot of responsibility. For example, in Nigeria, internet data is very expensive. So it's, it makes it very difficult for people to actually contribute because they feel they're not getting paid for doing that. So uh, we need to find a much more strategic way to engage them. So what we do basically sometimes is that we subsidize their internet data. We can give them internet to say, okay, uh, if you have internet, you'll be able to contribute uh, to any project of your choice. Uh, and uh, what we also do basically is that we provide on wiki support for them. Uh, and that's why I, I very much fancy those big communities where they have you know, policies on do not buy new editors because that is when they need the support the most. So we must find a way to 
you know, support them. So what we do basically is that on a daily basis, we check the recent changes because the influx of content there is very low, being a small language Wikipedia. So sometimes they make mistakes, but they don't know, or they don't know how to go back to what they did. So we go through the recent changes to identify these problems and sometimes call their attention to it and allow, the, the, allow them to fix it themselves. So, but if we see that this is a more complex thing, for example, with the mess up with templates, uh, we just fix that for them and show them how we do that. So that way they gain our support. And if we see any experienced editors trying to arrive to these new people, uh, we send a private chat to say, hey, this person is new. Uh, we need to uh, find a way to uh, uh, talk to them respectfully so that we don't end up, uh, you know, getting their annoying and the living project. Because everybody wants to be appreciated for their works. One of the ways we also give them support is to appreciate them when they do something very nice. For example, we can say, hey, we are making you the editor of the week. So design banner, put your face and say, these are our most active editors you know, uh, this week. So that way they find it interesting and they want to continue to be the editor of the week. So that way they stick around. So those are the ways we have shown support. Then many of the people in our networks are students, uh, which means they don't work. So most of the times when they come for events, we try as much as possible to subsidize their transportations, which means we, even if we can't pay for it in full, we give them a significant amount of uh, the money that will take care of that course because we understand that they can't afford it. So that way they don't have anything to lose. They come, they acquire skills, they go back home happy and wants to do more. Uh, the, the skill uh, acquisitions that uh, Toshi mentioned uh, is very is very key, you know, because continuous improvement is something that um, uh, should be a core value of every organization. So even the experienced editors, we retrain them because some people, for example, they can edit, they can do all kinds of things, but they don't understand basic uh, copyright uh, licenses. So they don't know that some of these things, some of the contents they use are under specific licenses. So we train them on how to identify those licenses and how to effectively, you know, um, contribute without violating copyright. So we do that as a way to also be capacity for a new editor. So um, Toshi excessively talked about leadership, you know, which is key because, um, uh, everybody wants to be respected. They want to be able to do things on their own. And, uh, but we try to decentralize it actually, which means we, we, we let everybody feel they are a leader. I am a leader, uh, my other colleagues are leaders because what differentiates the both of us is roles. We just assign roles. And if we say, okay, you are leading this project, it does not necessarily mean that you are a boss to me. And if I'm leading a project, it doesn't mean I'm a boss to you. But it's just role assignment, and that has really worked, you know, and uh, for 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 community as as a whole. Absolutely, really interesting points there, and I think the point about being patient with people when they get things wrong is really important. It's it comes down to um, building a kind community, and I think. Building a kind community is, is something very worthwhile. I would want to be part of a community that's like that. So on to our next question. Uh, for some food of thought. Uh, apologies, Isaac, I did not move forward to your slide there previously. Um, but the question is, uh, how do you motivate your community? So uh, back to Tochi for this one. Um, thank you again. So there are various ways we um, motivate our communities, and um, I'm glad Isaac has mentioned contest. It's also a way we've been um, motivating the community when it feels like the spirit is low. You just find something and then organize a contest, and you see a lot of people joining in, and a lot of people wanting to do um, better than the other. Um, we attach maybe shopping vouchers to it or to the contest and then people get to contest for them. And sometimes we, we make these very beautiful souvenirs, um, notebooks, water bottles and brand them Evo Wikimedia. And like there's this, personally for me, there's this joy and pride um, of having something that belongs to the Evo community and then, oh, 
when someone is like, hey, even Wiki, I'm like, yeah, this is a community of Wiki um, editors that I'm a part of. So if you're part of this community, you can get this, blah, blah, blah. So this helps to like make you a full grown member of the community. And um, another thing is shorter meeting durations. We know that there's a lot of things for people to do. So we do not want to waste anybody's time. We try as much as possible to limit our meetings to one hour. And then we try as much as possible to make sure that even as you're coming, even though you do not join before, we have recordings. And even at that, we're not going to stay beyond the one hour. We, we always um, talk about this, hey, the earlier you join, the earlier we finish. So we make sure we don't waste anyone's time. And the community always says, yeah, what I liked about the meeting was that it didn't waste time. We didn't um, spend more than an hour. So this has been a motivation for them to attend, especially online events. Then another one is data reimbursements after meetings. Like um, Isaac mentioned, we have people in our community who are um, just students and it's a lot for them to tackle their school and um, living expenses in school and then also coming to add data to it. Um, if you notice or if you've known, according to um, a global research, data in Africa is the most expensive um, compared to other parts of the world. So we try to subsidize this and to reimburse them so that they can be motivated to keep editing. Um, another thing we do is to link them up with opportunities. If there are people who are quite more savvy in this area, and you see opportunities coming from that area, you share it with them and they are more motivated to be a part of it because you remember them. Another thing is when it's their bad days, we try to, it's not too, it might not be too perfect. We just try to make a cool Canva design and put the person's picture and we're like, happy birthday with, with member Ibu Wikimedia Sister Group. We post it on our channels and they are very happy to see it. Other people wish them happy birthdays and they are excited and happy to be um, part of the community. Another thing is making headlines to make them proud. We always, as much as possible, strive to um, do things better to improve and to make the community proud. Um, I remember, um, sometime, was it 2017, 2018, 2019, um, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, um, one of the renowned authors in Nigeria, she she actually mentioned um, the people who edit Igbo Wikipedia, she tweeted it and she's like, these people are doing great. And it was so exciting for us, we screenshot the um, tweet and shared it with the community. They were excited that what they were doing was recognized. And another thing was, we tried to, um, okay, so um, was it last year during um, the Women's Month was uh, the Igbo Wikipedia was recognized as the Wikipedia with the highest number of women editors. We shared the news with them and they were very excited. Recently, we got a collaboration with um, Wikimedia Deutschland to be able to um, continue the Wikimental Africa program. We shared the news and they are always excited to be making headlines, to be part of the community. So this kind of thing makes them proud. And another thing is to reiterate the value proposition. This is the reason why we're here. This is the reason why we're here. If you go to the Iwo Wikipedia, when we started, the, the, um, the interface, the, the user interface of the Igbo Wikipedia was not friendly enough. And the write-ups there were not done by Igbo speakers. And so it's made work difficult in the Igbo Wikipedia. Now we keep telling them, this is the reason why we do this. If you do not do this, someone else somewhere will do it for you in a way that it shouldn't be. And you have no other choice than to take it. So if you stand up as an Igbo speaker to do this thing, it will not give another person um, somewhere else who doesn't speak this language an opportunity to come and do it for you on your behalf. And then when you go, it's difficult for you and you complain. So let us wake up and do this. So this kind of reiterating the value proposition, the reason why we started this and the reason why we're here, keep them motivated to keep doing things. So these are the various ways we've been um, keeping our community motivated. Okie dokie, thank you very much. And so on to Isaac's part. Uh, and as a reminder, um, it's all about how do you motivate your community?
Next slide, Richard. Okay. Okay, you can take that. So um, for us, motivation comes in different um, uh, uh, modes. Um, one of the things we do is that we provide incentives for participants during context or campaign, for example, because um, people find it interesting to compete. That's fine, but they, they find it much more interesting when they have something to win. When they say, hey, if I win this, I mean, if I becomes the most or top contributors, I get this mug or a vice or cap or a t-shirt. So they find it much more interesting. So we try as much as possible uh, to provide local price for some of this, uh, you know, larger context. For example, uh, we have Wikilos Monument where people come from different part of the world and compete for the international price. We know that many of these volunteers uh, from the from our community may not really be able to clinch to the uh, you know, uh, international price. So we just try to, you know, create a small price for them within their own uh, communities. Uh, I mean, within their own community that they can, you know, uh, also compete for. So that way they get motivated and they want to, you know, do more in that context. So I talked earlier about um, you know, the, this idea of supporting with internet data. I mean, it's extremely expensive here in this part of the world. And considering the economic situation of Nigeria, it's very important to support volunteers with this internet data. So that way they get motivated because they know they are not actually spending the time from their posts, you know, to contribute. So that, that's, uh, you know, motivate them. Then we also give them privileges to participate and attend conferences. Uh, you know, the fact that uh, I'm a leader does not necessarily mean that I have to be the one to represent the group at all time. No, we also pass it down. So when there are opportunities, for conferences, for example, which many we ask them to register. Uh, for example, for this con, I mean, for this conference, the Sentinel conference, we share the link with them. Let them participate in it. Let them, you know, learn from other people. So that way, they get motivated because they don't see only a single person going for those conferences. So uh, it's one of the ways we have motivated our volunteers over the years. Then we share training opportunities with them. Uh, because we want to upskill them, want them to gain new insights, new knowledge. Uh, because we understand that the more you know, knowledge they gain, the more valuable it becomes for the community because they have to contribute those knowledges to the growth of our community. So we, we, we share that uh, you know, opportunities with them. Then we also listen to their opinions. You know, sometimes they have an idea of how to make a change. Uh, we listen to them, uh, and sometimes we help them to refine their ideas. But we realize that most of the opinions are very useful. And if you don't listen to them, uh, many of them won't, be, won't feel comfortable to the community. So we make sure that all voices count. Uh, we don't suppress uh, you know, uh, opinions and all of that. Then um, we've talked about leadership, which is very key. Uh, that's why it keeps, it, it keeps coming up, you know, in my, uh, you know, comments. Leadership is very important. It's, it gives people a sense of uh, belonging. They, they, it keeps them motivated. They want to do more. They want to prove to you that they can do better in that position. And that's, you know, have a significant impact on the overall uh, community growth and uh, development. Um, the role is also uh, synonymous to leadership. Uh, you know, when you assign roles to people, they are motivated, they, they feel better, you know, and they want to deliver, they want to surpass your, your imagination. So all of these uh, encompasses actually keep our volunteers motivated. Excellent. Thank you. So let me just check. I believe that takes us on to the Q&A section of this part. So let me have a look. Um, as a reminder for the audience, this is about how to uh, retain and engage with editors. Uh, and like before, I'm going to ask the audience to put their messages in the chat. Um, if you're an active participant, you'll be able to ask your questions directly um, to our speakers. Um, 
we already had a couple of questions in the chat. So I will come to Robin's question. Let me scroll up and find it. He said um, some really interesting stuff on motivation there. Um, he on the Welsh Wikipedia, they have a problem in that they sometimes have uh, non Welsh editors creating articles based on Google Translate. So taking a text, running it through a machine translation, and then adding it to the Welsh Wikipedia. Um, and there's no doubt it's done with the best of intentions, but it leads to stuff which isn't particularly good quality. Um, is this a problem you've experienced with your communities and how do you deal with it? Yes, um, if I can go. <laughs> I, I must say that that's a general problem that small languages Wikipedia uh, face uh, because they are technical languages uh, and you know, getting the right translation or the right person to translate uh, is often very difficult. So we see people who just don't understand those languages. Yes, they want to contribute, they feel they want to help. Uh, but you know, any mess you create in a sincere effort to help is still a mess. So as much as possible, we, we just delete those things on site. Um, and sometimes if we can engage that person, because some of them might actually be native speakers, maybe they are just lazy, uh, and all of that. So we engage them and let them understand that you don't have to write so long, I mean, so bulky articles. You can, you know, write it very shortly and that will still make sense. And over time, you can improve it. And that has worked. That's helped us to identify some native speakers who continue to contribute to up to now. Because uh, just deleting it might be too harsh, you know, because uh, when you delete, delete, they stop coming. And you might actually be losing editors. It might be people who can really hard read value. So we try to engage, if we engage them and they don't um, you know, uh, respond or their response uh, since are not satisfactory, we want them to refrain from doing that. But when they do that again, we just block. So which means that person is not uh, there to build an encyclopedia. So we, we, we just either delete, uh, but we restrict the blocking tool for very serious uh, abuse. I mean, if we delete it, you come back, we still delete, not let for to just frustrate you. And, but if you keep coming, then we just block your accounts. So um, it's, it's a common challenge that we face. Uh, but sometimes if they use the Google machine tool, uh, we can see them to modify it if it's not a bulky uh, content. If the content can still be useful, we can usify it, we can make it much more meaningful and stick it. But Van, like this is a general problem that we face. Excellent, thank you. So, uh, Onwaku, uh, you had a question earlier, and as you're one of our active participants, I'm going to uh, invite you to unmute. Okay, would you like to ask your question? If not, good morning. Okay. Good morning. Yeah, I want to ask, especially to Isaac. Then he, he talked about uh, a, a, a kind of feedback to those who, who receive the who we are taught or maybe a victim. So, how do we continue following them up? How? How do we continue following them so that we monitor them, their progress, monitor them, their abilities? How? Because if you say continue editing, continue uploading, they might make mistakes. So how? Tell us steps. What uh, steps? Good. Thank you very much, uh, Glory. Uh, I don't know if she's still speaking, but it looks like I've lost her. <laughs> so that will get the block. Done with my question. Okay. I'm done with my question. Okay, I think I, I get the points, but I must confirm that uh, dealing with new editors sometimes can be very challenging uh, because it's very difficult for us to identify what they really want. 
Do you really want to contribute content or you just want to contribute to the community in other ways? So if we are able to identify what they really want or how they can you know, be uh, net positive to the project, it becomes very easy for us. But um, if you have groups of people you recently trained and you're trying to identify how you can effectively support them, create that WhatsApp group for them. When you create a WhatsApp group, make a post there. For example, you can share a link to an article and ask them to fix it. So you just fold your hands and watch those that will fix it. Sometimes you don't get a response, but make sure you post again and see if someone somewhere will show up. That way you'll be able to gauge the interest of the people there because you can have hundreds of people in a group and maybe only 10 or five people are really you know, active you know, and all of that. So when you identify these people that are ready to do something but maybe because they don't have adequate experience on how to do it properly you can as a matter of fact call them uh, through the whatsapp call and say hey i see that you are trying to edit these articles uh what challenges are you facing and how do you think i can help you so that way they find it interesting because it's better than wall of text because uh, I know for a fact that written language and spoken languages are not the same. So if you are typing, they might really not get what you're trying to say. But if you put a call through because they are within your local uh, environment, immediate environment, you can ask them how this, that Some of them will tell you, oh, I'm trying to add a reference, and but it's not showing up. What do I need to do? So that way you can say, okay, do you mind if we have a short meeting maybe later in the day to discuss this? I will share the link with you on Zoom and I will subsidize for your internet data. It will be readily available. So you, if you can actually deal with that person or make sure they are about two or three, then you group them together and do that. So that way you, you will buy their trust. You know, they will believe in what you do and they see that you have shown leadership, you are ready to support them, and that way they want to continue to come. So it, it can be very challenging, you know that, but uh you, you can adopt different strategies for different you know group of people depending on what their training needs is or how you need to effectively address them so i've got a couple of questions from the previous section i tempted to go back to but i think there's something which relates very closely to what you said um because you, you mentioned that um written language and spoken language are not the same. Um, Rhoda asked a question, um, another active participant, so I will ask them to unmute so they might be able to ask themselves. I'll just wait a moment to see if that works. Oh, okay. Hello. Hi there. All right. The, um, the question I asked was for individuals who um, can speak a language, but they are not very good at writing that language. They, are, they can write it, but they are not very good. And they wish to contribute on Wikip um, Wikipedia, maybe um, Yoruba Wikipedia, Igbo Wikipedia, and, or Ahosa Wikipedia. So what can they do? Is there something that they can do? Or is there like, um, uh, is there an interface that corrects them or that give them insights on how they can contribute to Wikipedia? That's the Yoruba Wikipedia or the Igbo Wikipedia that they can contribute properly without vandalizing the articles or disrupting Wikipedia. So I'd like to know if there is, um, Maybe someone who can put them through on what to do while they are editing or they are trying to edit. So that's my question. Um. Okay. Um. Hi, Rhoda. Thank you for the question. Um. For us in the Igbo community, usually you will have people who are not very savvy in the language, and they are willing to contribute. So what we do is, like I said, we have mentorship. There are um, specific people in our community 
who have the willingness to assist others. So what we do for these people, personally, I've handled um, such persons. What we do is, um, first of all, let them write the articles. Um, get uh, maybe like a particular example of a wiki article, give to them. They write it in the same arrangement, the same style with all of their references. And you look at it and correct them. You can also give it to people, um, maybe someone else in your community who is maybe um, much more learned than you in the particular language and they help to correct it or correct whatever it is. Then the person can go ahead and upload it to your Wikipedia. So for, for us, we have um, Igbo language teachers. We have PhD holders in Igbo language who are also part of our community. We have um, librarians from various universities who are from our community, and they're always willing to assist in one way or the other to make the grammar very much okay. So these are the people we pair them with. That's if I'm, unav if I'm unavailable to assist, I can give you to other people who are very much willing to assist. Um, one person in our hub who does this is goodness. She's very, very open to um, assisting new editors and also fixing all of these errors. And also the librarians community, they are very much open for this. So this is what we do. Allow them to write it off wiki and then get to proofread it or give someone else to proofread it and they go ahead and post it. So in that way you avoid and maybe making someone's spirit go low and they finally just decide to go away. Sometimes you can also refer them to other projects that do not involve you writing a whole long essay. For example, in Igbo language, I can refer you to Wikidata where you just add like short descriptions in Igbo language and it should be very perfect that you don't need too much grammar. So in that, in that way, we're all safe. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, there were a couple of questions I was hoping to come back to, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. Um, it's possible I might be able to squeeze them in towards the end. I will try and fit them in as best as I can. Um, so to wrap up this section, uh, I'm looking for some thoughts on what are the main points we can take away from this part of the discussion. Again, do feel free to write uh, your answers in the chat. It can be one word answers, it can be a couple of sentences, whatever you have time for. Um, and as a reminder, of course, active participants, people currently on the screen are able to unmute themselves and say on mic what the, the key points are. Um, and I will get things started uh, because, yeah, the thing which really stands out for me is the importance of mentorship and having a kind community um, and keep in mind that people will get things wrong. It happens. We're all human. We're all learning and learning involves getting things wrong. So I think having a kind, open community with some kind of support structure is really important. Um, I think that's that's enough thought from me. Is there anyone else who would like to say some key points from this section? Okie dokie. In that case, I'm going to take us on to our third and final section. So thank you everyone for uh, keeping with us. I'm aiming to finish around uh, 12 at this uh, time zone. Um, and comments in the chat. Um, yeah, the importance of mentorship and skill development. And that's a really nice point as well about the importance of uh, data support and souvenirs, recognizing people's um, contributions and how much they are valued. Ooh. Maxwell, we might be able to deal with that particular question in this section. So the question is, or rather the theme is, how do we keep communities growing? And again, we'll have a couple of questions for our speakers. Um, I'm going to ask them to address them quite, quick, uh, quite briefly because we've got 25 minutes. 
Um, and then we'll have a bit of Q&A from the audience, trying to squeeze absolutely everything in here. So the first question, uh, what resources are most important to help a community keep growing? Uh, and again, I'll be starting with Tochi. So over to you. Okay. Um, so like I put out here, we have um, getting them involved in projects. Like it's one thing to um, kind of have communities. It's one thing to be part of something. But when you want to make someone to truly be a part of something or feel um, like he or she is actually very involved um, in such thing, you need to give them something to be involved in. So we make provisions for internal grants to run individual projects. A lot of them might have very cool ideas that they want to, um, um, should I say like they want to um, run or they want to bring to life. And this will also help to add name to our community to also make things um, like it's all of us who did it. So all you need to do is to try to get them involved. It helps to keep the community grow. If I'm just an OES member, I wouldn't want to get engaged. But if I'm involved in doing something, it would take time for me to backslide unless maybe something happens. Then um, we have this development of hubs, like I mentioned. In, in, it's a way of bringing it closer to home, bringing it closer to the people. Um, I'm here in Abuja. I may not be able to reach someone who is in Anambara, but there's a hub in Anambara that caters to that. So they are able to meet physically. They are also um, able to meet, I must say spiritually, <laughs> but they are also able to meet um, like online or virtually. And in such a way, in that way, they have like their own mini catchment area and they are also very much involved. So in that way, you try to make it closer to them, try to break it into smaller pieces. Then another thing is also try to put them together with people of um, interest. Like amongst the hubs we have, like I mentioned, we have the wiki data, we have the wiki commons. When you see people who are interested in what interests you, it helps you to keep getting involved and it helps you to keep um, getting engaged. Because I'm a librarian, you're seeing another librarian, it makes you happier. You're seeing someone else who is like you. So in that way, they are, um, it makes the community to grow and keep being together. Then another thing we do is outreach and awareness creation. This can never be overemphasized. We know that people know Wikipedia, most times when you say Wikimedia, they're like, are you sure you don't make a mistake? Are you sure you don't mean to say Wikipedia? And you're like, no, Wikimedia. And then you're like, this even a Wikimedia movement. And then they say um, Wikimedia Foundation. And they have no idea of what you're talking about. There is wiki quotes, there's every other thing, but most of them only know Wikipedia. Some don't even know the Wikipedia at all. So you have to keep doing the outreach and the awareness and let them know how they can use it to in my own part, I would still say language activism. They can use it to um, preserve their own languages. I've, I'm, I'm actually doing something similar in Mozambique for um, various Mozambican languages. And um, for now, we've been able to get the um, Makwa Wikipedia into the incubator and also trying to build a community around the Makwa language so that they can have people to keep contributing to the incubator, um, the language in, in the incubator. And since last year, September, they've been doing that. As at the moment, they, they now have over 300 articles in that Makwa language Wikipedia. And um, another university in Mozambique is already reaching out to be able to add um, another language, um, another Mozambican language to the incubator, because for them, this is more like language activism. Their language has never been digitized apart from the Bible translations um, into their language. So these are the other ways we are also trying to, not just to build the Igbo community, but also to build um, communities around other African languages. Now, another one is recruitment of new members. You need to keep getting people in. You need to keep getting people involved. You need to keep getting new people to keep it growing and not just the old people. The old people also need to try out their hands into mentoring and bringing up other people. And um, I just I was just about to say that, or I've just mentioned it's mentorship. Mentorship is very important in whatever it is that you do. 
it helps you um it helps people to go faster that than they would have done it helps people to um kind of not make the mistakes that maybe you yourself um have already made for us in the Igbo community the way we were in 2018 when we started it's not the same way we, we, we were in 2019 it's not the same way in 2020 it's not um, the same in 2021 and also now in 2022. So we keep growing, we keep learning from others and we keep getting more people involved and we keep um, sharing responsibilities and the community keeps growing and also keeps making um, more input and impact. So these are the ways we've kept our community growing. Thank you, that was very interesting indeed. Um, I think it's a really good point about um, people being able to see people like them engaging with the project and wanting to continue. And also fantastic to hear about activities to uh, yeah, bring languages online. So Isaac, uh, you're up next. I think you're still muted at the moment. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, volunteers are the greatest asset of our movement and for our project. So we continue to recruit and engage, you know, uh, volunteers because that's how you can keep the community growing. Um, then we do the mentorship, like I said, uh, when you, when you recruit these people after the training, you do have to find uh, an activity for them that will stick them around. Uh, and before they will be able to do all of that, they need to know what and what to do. And we have used the mentorship platform, like I said earlier, to uh, help them to understand how they can effectively uh, you know, participate. So they grow not only in numbers, but in capacity. And that has a significant impact on the quality of content we have on Encyclopedia and um, the quality of contributors that we have. Then again, one of the ways to also grow the community is to help them build capacity. Uh, and we don't just channel capacity building to new volunteers alone. We also you know, uh, build capacity for existing volunteers. And how do we do this? We try to identify they are trading needs. Uh, we don't just say come and attend training for attend for attendance sake. We on the, we want to identify what exactly you need to be trained on, and we look for people who also have you know similar problems or who also have the same training needs as you. Then we group them together and help them build capacity. So they grow, uh, like I said, in 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 terms of um, the quality of contributions they make to the project. So we also support with uh, small funding to run Mission Alive project. If there are individual members of the community that has a brilliant ideas on how to grow our community or how to improve you know, content and um, increase quantity of content, we can give small funding, no matter how small, to support that work. Um, that's something we also do to grow the community. Then uh, we've also established uh, urban clubs in various universities, because we understand that um, some of these languages are taught in school. For example, Yoruba is taught, is taught in all the schools, all the tertiary institutions in Nigeria. So, and we know because they are students of those languages, they have capacity, you know, far more than, you know, random people on the street or the market woman in the market or someone somewhere. So we also establish fan clubs in those schools uh, and I'm proud to say that many of the people who are attending this uh, conference today here in the hall are largely students of Yoruba languages from University of Lagos and from different universities. So this has helped us to grow because it ensures continuity, which means when they graduate from, the, from their institutions, new set will come in, they will train those ones because they have capacity on their own, they can train the incoming uh, new students. And when those ones go, another set will come. So it continues to you know, uh, be a continuous thing. Uh, and that has been one of the strategic way to grow small languages. Then we also support new and existing volunteers with the necessary infrastructures to grow. Uh, 
Uh, recently, we realized that um, many of them are affected by the IP block, uh, uh, global IP block policy. So, which means they can't log in, they can't edit, they can't do anything. And these are people who have capacity con to contribute to their local language. They don't care what happened on the English Wikipedia or somewhere on Meta. And they are affected by the blocks that were, you know, I mean, block policy that, blocking policy that was implemented there. So what we do as a way to support them is to help them create a, a local IP block exemptions. So once we, you know, recruit them, uh, as a site sub, I just grant them the IP block exemptions, either on request or, or without request, because many of them may not know what it means. So in order to not create unnecessary uh, uh, problems, so we just grant them IP block exemptions, and that has helped them to, you know, uh, to contribute to that language. So there, there has never been much uh, concerns from the Uruguay Wikipedia about the global IP block uh, policy that affects largely uh, many volunteers. So this, this was a strategic way to you know, support our volunteers. Then we also do what, we, what I would describe as a strategic, strategic coordination of outreach and awareness campaign. So um, we have uh, been largely involved in you know, many awareness campaigns as a group, for example, the Uruguay Wikipedia uh, We've done several awareness campaigns to recruit volunteers. And we're also working on one now uh, that involves you know, using a major skit maker, uh, a comedian uh, known as Mr. Macaroni. So uh, he has huge number of followers on Twitter, I think close to 3 million on Twitter alone, then you know, millions of followers on other platforms. So if he designs that you know, uh, materials and tweet it, so we will reach millions of people so that's a strategic, you know, coordination of outreach and awareness uh, campaign. So that way, a lot of people want to learn more about Yoruba Wikipedia. For many of them, we visit the site to say, ah, so we have Yoruba Wikipedia. I thought we only have the English Wikipedia. So those are strategic ways to keep the community growing. And that has, uh, you know, worked significantly for the growth uh, and development of our community and the project at large. Yeah, quite an innovative approach to uh, getting involvement there um, and I I sympathize with the IP block issue it's not something I've had to deal with much myself but I can imagine how disruptive that would be and we do have a question about it as well um, we'll come to that later time permitting uh, so we we'll move on to the next question um, which Got 12 minutes left for the session. I might go over by a couple of minutes, but not too long, I promise. So what are your ambitions for your community? So I think we'll have to take this one fairly quickly to squeeze in some questions, but uh, Tochi, over to you. Okay, um, so for my community, I actually just want to see our community making so much impact while growing. Um, in as much as we want to grow, we want to be um, very large in numbers, we still want to make impacts as we're going. Then we also want to develop um, well, we commit a community that will develop capable leaders. We don't just want to have a community of OES members. We want people to be able to do something, to be able to stand out. That's the kind of community I love to be in. Then um, another thing I want is all of our um, test projects, our uh, community test projects, just be out of the incubator, have their own very cool URL that anyone can just um, go on. And then we also want to be a talk of the global community. We don't just want to be Igbo Wikimedians as a group that would just um, be somewhere in Nigeria. We want to be heard about when you go to um, Germany, we want to be heard about when you go to the UK, we want to be heard about when you go to any part of Asia. and. That's all we want. We want our um, articles across projects to keep um, increasing. I remember when we were still at 1,000 articles on the Igbo Wikipedia, and now we are at um, more than 7,000 articles. It's a very much big growth for us. It might not be the same for someone in, my, in another community or in another language Wikipedia, but for us, it's a very big one. So this is just the kind of growth we want to see in our community. So thank you very much. And so over to Isaac. Thank you very much. I have a very big dream <laughs> for my community. Uh, I want to help build a 
Wikipedia community that can sustain itself, you know, a community that really does not need too much of support, you know, from the Wikimedia Foundation, for example, to grow. Uh, I want to help build a Wikipedia community that can meet the content need of our readers, because the primary aim of the encyclopedia is to serve our readers, not to serve us. So I want to help build, you know, such communities that people will visit and find something very meaningful, uh, you know, to read and, you know, impart their lives. So I want to help build a Wikipedia community that can compete in terms of quality content and contributors with other large Wikipedia. Uh, I want to help build I think Isaac's video may have frozen. It's certainly... The community that is the top of the mind, people are thinking they want to head build a such community, Yoruba Wikipedia, or is it in English? So a top of the mind brand is what I want to help build. Then I also want to help build a community that will require little resources for sustainability. Uh, I know it's a big dream. Uh, it will take time, but we continue to push and we hope that um, it will uh, yield the desirable result with time. Everything is possible. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I think that brings us to the Q and A. Um, we've had a couple of people asking about the IP block issue. So let me have a look at the attendee list. Uh, Maxwell. Uh, asks, the IP block is a big issue, how can it be resolved? The reason is after edit-thons, um, people go home and they're not motivated to continue. So certainly sympathise with that. Um, I think as well, folding onto that, uh, Omoku asks, um, how can they get uh, block exemption for their IP address? So it's might be a, a joint answer there. So I think mainly for Isaac, that question. Okay, if I can go first, uh, uh, Richard. So um, IP block exemptions uh, result from a global policy to minimize disruptions across multiple languages Wikipedia. But I must stress that each language Wikipedia is autonomous on its own, which means you make your own rules, you have your own local policies, but you have to comply, of course, with the Wikipedia Foundation's terms of use, but you still have to develop your own uh, policies. So uh, that uh, brings us to the fact that in your various language community, you can actually localize all the tools that you have in bigger languages. For example, uh, in the case of IB block exemptions we're talking about, you can get it localized on your wiki. So when you get it localized on your wiki, you can grant member of your community. Uh, as a member of the community, you can ask the site sub there, that's the administrator, to grant you IP block exemptions when you experience that. So for your local community, the IP block exemptions will protect you, which means you won't be affected by the other blocks. It does not necessarily mean that if you visit any other language Wikipedia, you will be affected. But for that limited IP block exemptions on Yoruba Wikipedia, you will not be affected by the block on Yoruba Wikipedia. So uh, if you are a community leader or an administrator on a small language Wikipedia, it is something you can actually do. Uh, but if you uh, want me to put you through, you can reach out to me. Uh, I, I think Richard uh, shared my contact earlier, or maybe we'll share it again. So I can help you if you are a size up or on your small language Wikipedia, I can help you uh, find a way to get it localized so that you can grant members members of your community that access so that they can seamlessly contribute without any hindrance. But let me add that um, I'm, 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 a, I'm a size up on Yoruba Wikipedia, for example. I can't grant you IP block exemption on the, on Igbo Wikipedia or Hausa Wikipedia. So uh, to get that kind of exemptions, you have to apply on Meta you know, uh, so the um, stewards there can grant you. But if you don't know how to go through that, uh, 
that. You can talk to your local administrator and see phone so that you don't need to go to Meta to get uh, how to block it. Okay, okay, and thank you very much for that answer. Um, so looking back at a question from Abdul earlier, um, specifically for Tochi, is uh, I want to find out uh, how do you handle people who have zero edit counts and they are part of the community's platforms, but they don't contribute in any way to the growth of the community when in actual fact they are regarded as experts in the local language. So how do you engage with people who are experts in the, the language, already have a Wikimedia account, but don't actually edit with it? Um, maybe um, this could be because they have a whole lot of things to do with their time. So for, for us, uh, for me, what I do is that just reach out to them personally, get them involved in other things that might not have to do with editing. You might get them involved in checking people's grammar. You might get them involved in maybe being just administrators on the wiki. You might just get them involved in maybe um, trying to put someone through in one way or the other, or just put them in charge of, um, let's say you have an internal grant, put them in charge of that administrative aspect of it. Just get them involved in one, or one way or the other. Even if it has to do with outreach, just get them involved. But at, at least just reach out to them, try to find out from them what exactly the problem is. Most of them is time. So in as much as it's time, get them involved in something else. You can also suggest other um, projects to them. Like I said, people are there, but they don't know they can do other things apart from Wikipedia. Let them know that there are other things they can get their time involved in that wouldn't take so much of their time. So just figure out ways to get them involved. That's just mine. For me, even when people leave our WhatsApp group, I reach out, hey, I noticed you left the WhatsApp group. Was there any way we offended you? Was there anything we did? At least even if you're not joining us, we'll learn from it. And they tell you what the challenge was or is, and you know what else to do from there. So just reach out to them and get them involved. Thank you. Absolutely. And I think that personal touch can make a huge difference. Um, yeah. So we have a, uh, another couple of questions. So I'm going to start with the one in the Q&A. Uh, how do you encourage or follow up with a member of your community who has an interest in WMF projects, but has not been contributing in a long while? So this might be a bit similar to what we just discussed, but I think could perhaps also apply to people who have previously been very active or been involved in some activities but whose engagement has tailed off a bit so i think we're going to see some similar thoughts to uh that previous question from abdul so who would like to take this question on okay i could go um okay this is more like the scenario someone from your community who doesn't um, get engaged in community projects goes to apply for a grant um, to run projects. For me, um, I don't see a problem with it. Everyone has their own um, areas of interest. Maybe the person has identified something else that they would want to do that the community doesn't do. That is perfectly fine. At least in Igbo language existing, we say Igwe Bike and Enokoma Marano, like Yobo Fufu, like when we all come together, even with our differences, we'll be able to make a very big difference. So I don't have a problem with you going to apply for a grant and for you to reach out to us, maybe as a community to get involved in one way or the other, that is also totally cool. We'll support you in any way we can, um, even if it is maybe to guide you on how to um, run the project that you're running that you want to run that is perfectly okay we just try to um like help you or support you in our own um very little way we've had um challenges or we had we've had scenarios where even people that are not from the Igbo community are referred to the Igbo community because they want to maybe apply for one grant or the other to be able to carry out one project or the other. We're very much happy to support them. We don't have a problem with that. We can all do this when we come together because I can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. So we're all in this together. Anywhere you like, come from. 
just to progress the movement. We're fine with it. Excellent. So I, I hope that answers that question. Um, and let's see. Uh, another question from the audience for both of our speakers. Uh, do you give back to the community you live as regards to corporate social responsibility? I have to confess, um, that is not something I know about. So if we need a bit more explanation, uh, we may have to ask a person who's um, ask, asking that question in the chat. So um, thank you for that questions. I mean, that particular question uh, regarding social, uh, sorry, corporate uh, social responsibilities. I mean, many of us are prolific content creators and millions of people actually read these contents. That's alone, it's the social, the corporate social responsibility, which means you are giving back to the community. Beyond, you know, growing communities, training new editors, building capacity for them. You also write content, quality content for people to read. And that alone is a corporate social responsibility. That's one of the ways we also give back to the society. Yeah. Um, to add to what Isaac has just said, for me, uh, for us, we also get ourselves involved in things that do not have to even do with Wikipedia. Like we said, from our community, we are more um, on the language activism um, side of it. We've tried to even translate stuff that have to do with Google Translate because we know that every other person gets to use it and it's a way of giving back to the community. Um, we've also tried to, like even the, the Yoruba community, we've once come together to um, translate articles that have to do with human trafficking. That is a way of um, giving back to our community to make that knowledge available to people who wouldn't on a normal day be able to access it in the um, English language. We've also come together to um, translate some articles that have to do with uh, maybe malaria, um, information about malaria, because it's something that affects not just Nigeria, but also the, the continent as a whole. So these are various ways we've, um, various ways we've come to give back to our community. We might not have money to give them, or we give something that we know would be useful. Yeah, very much so. And knowledge is very valuable. So that that has a lot of use as well, I'm sure. So, ooh. okay. One last question, because that's quite an interesting one. So uh, we have a question from the co-founder of the Ghanaian Pigeon Wikimedians Community Group. Uh, currently developing the Ghanaian Pigeon uh, Wikipedia in the incubator. The language is not written much, so how can they go about it since they're trying to standardise it? That's a really challenging one. Um, would either of our speakers uh, like to address that question? You know, um, this is actually a very big challenge. And this was a, a challenge I, I encountered with the Mozambique community, because for Igbo, we have a lot of things that have already been written in Igbo, so it was quite easier for us. But for the Mozambique community, for example, when we we're starting out the Makua language in the incubator, it was very difficult because there was no blog, um, not even a newsletter, or maybe anything that was written in the language apart from the Bible. So for us, what we did was, um, Personally, because I was in the forefront of the project, um, I got in touch with, um, sh should I, educators, the Makua language educators. So we got um, people from the Rovuma University. I at least identified with one very particular lecturer. He's very keen on sharing knowledge in the Makua language. Um, I got them together, he got his friends, and they've been developing stuff that have to do with the Makua language. They also train even the contributors on the best practices of adding things in Makua language. So these are the various ways. For them now, they are trying to standardize the language by themselves. So if you have um, people like this, 
you can reach out to them if the language is maybe taught in the university and even though it's not written somewhere it doesn't have a textbook or anything you can reach out to this group of people to start developing something for the language that will help the wiki another problem was also citing and referencing the language because there was nothing to cite or nothing to reference but they have a whole lot of things to do with oral history oral citation we approached it from this angle it doesn't have to be written references or maybe um written stuff for Igbo language there is this um organization that helps to standardize Igbo language but at the point i think the organization went slow they are no longer so much in existence but there are Igbo language educators that have come together to start doing um, this project or this work itself. So you try to identify with this group of people and they will help you a very whole lot because the people from the Rovuma University, the professors are the ones now helping to do the, um, the Translate Wiki interface translation for the, um, the um, Makua language Wikipedia. And they are also the ones who go back to the, uh, the already written articles to make sure they are very well written so that they can pass um, quality knowledge and not just putting out anything into the incubator for it to come out of the incubator. So these are these are just the ways I've approached, at least from my own experience, I've approached a language like that. You might want to try it out. And as you're going on or you, as you keep trying it, you would also find um, other lessons that you might also, that might be helpful to you. Indeed, that sounds like some very useful advice. Uh, so we are on to the, the final leg of the workshop. Thank you everyone for sticking around. I appreciate it is a little bit after the plan end time. So we're going to have a little bit more use of the chat, but rather than Q&A, it's going to be uh, what have been the key points from this session. So again, like before, feel free to drop any thoughts into the chat about what you think the main points with this have been. Um, and just to chip in for me, I think um, what's come through is the importance of continuing to reach out to new groups so that communities can grow and a bit of technical knowledge as well to help people out. So that when people get stuck, um, they can find some support. So I'll give the audience a, a couple of moments to add anything to the chat in case I want to talk about the most important points from this section. Okie dokie. And then we're on to the final stage, the wrap up from this session. So all it really is, is I'm going to uh, ask if anyone has um, thoughts about the workshop, um, some key points from it. And then I'm going to tell you about what comes next with the next workshop. So uh, I would be really interested in hearing from the audience, uh, what are the most interesting things you've discovered or learned about during this workshop. Um, I've certainly uh, learned a fair amount myself. And again, I'll, I'll give you a few moments to have a think and put stuff in the chat. Uh, and while that's being done, um, I'll just look ahead. So, um, you are more than welcome to join the various Telegram groups we have around the Celtic Knot. It can be a really good way to follow up some of the conversations here, um, ask questions if um, I didn't get around to uh, bringing them to the speakers, or maybe something has occurred to you since which you'd really like some input in. Um, please do consider using the Telegram groups. Um, they are a very welcoming and friendly community. Um, and yeah, feel free to also do stuff like share um, your LinkedIn profile in the chat so we can connect with people. Um, and there are some community uh, growth events. Uh, so do check out uh, the satellite events around Celtic Knot. And finally, from me, 
The next workshop begins in just under an hour, and it is about how to organize or join an editing campaign. So again, a really useful tool for community growth. I think that's it for this workshop. So before you all head off, I just want to say thank you to the speakers, thank you to our audience, and thank you to our act participants. Um, the Celtic Knot is only as good as the people who are actually able to contribute their time and share their experience. Um, I'm incredibly grateful to Isaac and Toshi for sharing their knowledge and expertise. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you.